In the tapestry of our tale, our gallant adventurer embarks on a quest, a journey seeking forbidden knowledge from the ancients. Legends weave stories of an indomitable pair of hacker tools, born from the very essence of a fiery forge, sisters crafted in the crucible of revelation and enlightenment, cast their discerning gaze upon different realms. One, the realm of Windows 95 and 98, the other cast their gaze upon Windows NT. Forged in the arcane annals of the Cult of the Dead Cow, the sisters found their creators in the revered members of the herd. Sir Distic and Dildog, potent wizards skilled in the art of crafting tools with peculiar abilities. Aligned in purpose, yet distinctive in their enlightening endeavours, the sisters, Back Orifice, and back orifice 2K were bestowed upon the realm of humans at the fateful gathering known as DEFCON. Our intrepid seeker, driven by an unquenchable thirst for knowledge, sought counsel from the oracles at the revered Sands Institute. Perhaps there he could learn of the origin of the sisters. Tell me about the back orifice. <laughs> the back orifice. <laughs> Tell me about the back orifice. <laughs> the back orifice. <laughs> the back orifice. <laughs> Alas, the Sands Oracle's whispers offered no solace, leaving our adventurer to beseech the creator of arts and literature, hoping to unveil the secrets of the benevolent sisters. I, I need you to answer this question for me. Yeah. What is the back orifice? That is a very philosophical question, and one that I'm happy to poetically answer for you. <laughs> well, this is, uh, this is what I came up with. Okay. It's sneaky. The hardware's leaky. Have you taken a peek in the back door? Do you see the problem with each hole that the cold code explores? It's obvious the orifice jostles with the office's moorishness, and for sure it is not just this there's problems with. Go for gold, shoot for the hole, a whole hole grows back to and fro. Do you know the rope that reaches round, bustles up from within the ground? A silent assassin, there is no sound, at least that's what I found. A reach around, a sneaky look, no need to be anal and go by the book. What is gone has been took, the back orifice, I could write a book. Though the words spun by this artistic virtuoso were elegant and entertaining, they did not wholly satisfy the adventurer's insatiable need for knowledge. When all avenues seemed shrouded in mystery, our hero dared the perilous journey to the heart of the abyss, where the potent wizards, known by the names Sadistic and Dildog, once breathed life into the sisters. The echoes of their craftsmanship lingered in the winds of time, and so he set forth to hear the words of these wizards for himself. And so I ventured forth on my epic quest. The remainder of this tale unfolds in the discourse between myself and the esteemed Sardistic, unraveling the origins of the back orifice. But anticipate with eagerness the forthcoming sequel where I engage in conversation with the venerable Dildog shedding light upon the genesis of back orifice 2K. While on my odyssey, a profound lesson revealed itself, and that is, in the vastness of all of Middle-earth, there exists no seamless path to transition from the Lord of the Rings to the realm of interviews. So, this is all I've got. I am Sir Distic. I don't recall how long I've been a member of the Cult of the Dead Cow, but it's been 27 years. I went to DEF CON 3 kind of on a whim, I don't even really, didn't even really consider myself a hacker at that point, although everybody in my life did because that was back when people didn't really understand computers. It was 
computers were still more of a hobby than something everybody owned. And I uh, went to DEF CON 3 and met some of the Cult of the Dead Cow people and started hanging out with them socially. A couple lived in San Francisco, where I, or the Bay Area, where I, I live. And I was told that I was a member of the Cult of the Dead Cow a couple of years later, and we were off and running, I suppose. The Cult of the Dead Cow is largely a, uh, a publishing organization that allows you know, people to uh, have their projects amplified via uh, the media channels that Cult of the Dead Cow has spent decades establishing. Back Orifice was the first actual tool that was released by the Cult of the Dead Cow. Previous to that, it had largely been just information. It, Cult of the Dead Cow was originally a text file group, pre internet files were disseminated largely through bulletin board systems people dialing up from their home computer to somebody else's home computer and you know uploading and downloading files uh, via that uh, mechanism but i proposed the idea of publishing back orifice i had already basically written the tool you know there's a lot of different stories about the origins i wasn't asked by the cult of the dead cow to write back orifice i had written back orifice and thought it would be amusing, I suppose, and useful to uh, release it to the public. I had previously written a text file about, the title was, Who's Gonna Get Screwed Today? This is back when Microsoft's advertising marketing campaign uh, used the term, where do you wanna go today? I spent uh, quite a bit of time this was in like 96 or 97, I think. So Windows 95 came with what they called share level access control, which is instead of there being user accounts that you had to grant access to, you simply protected a share with a, a password. There was no security requirements on that password. I knew you could connect from one computer to another across your home network. Microsoft designed that in and uh, part of Microsoft's problems with security is that they wanted their software to be out of the box as connective and capable as possible. But of course, with every service that's exposed, you are opening up a potential security issue. I spent a lot of time researching, and this was in the days when the World Wide Web was in its infancy and you couldn't just Google things and find the answer. Google didn't even exist at that point. You know, it was Alta Vista and Yahoo, and the search engines were uh, pretty clunky back then. So I spent a fair amount of time trying to figure out how to connect from one computer to another across the internet. Uh, I knew it was possible, or I intuited it was possible, but there were several steps that you had to take, none of which were really just like properly documented. Once I figured out the process, which basically involved using a tool that came with Windows 95 called NBT Stat. You could use that to remotely query the machine names, well, all of the names that a machine had registered. You could use that across the internet. It was a UDP protocol. Uh, I later wrote my own handler for that protocol called NB Name, which allowed you to do lots of manipulations of that protocol because it wasn't really designed to be on the internet. It was designed for home networks. So once I figured that out, you had to you basically had to get the remote host name, which was one of the names that, you know, a computer registers, obviously. And then you had to add that host name and the IP address to a file in your System32 directory called LM Hosts. And then you could access that machine by name as if it was on your local network. And what I quickly discovered was that most people who had a home network had not intuited that those shares were accessible across the internet. And because they wanted to be able to connect to their computers at home, they had shared their entire hard drive with no password. Keeping in mind that this is back in the dial-up days where people were using AOL or small ISPs and their phone line to connect to the internet. So uh, after I published the text file on how to access shares, uh, one of the things I mentioned in that text file was, well, I mentioned a lot of things that this could be used for. Uh, and I kind of explained how the file structure of Windows 95 worked. Uh, and pointed out that uh, if the C drive was shared, you have access to their startup folder. And if you have access to their startup folder, you can run any program you want on their computer simply by leaving a executable in their startup folder. And then the next time they reboot, uh, it gets executed. And of course, uh, back then, Windows was also vulnerable to something called the ping of death, where if you sent a over a certain size, it would just crash the machine. 
So uh, it was, you know, it, it, it occurred to me that it was very easy to install software you wanted on a remote machine if they had their C drive shared, which turned out to be a lot of people. So then uh, it was a question of, well, what, what kind of thing would you want to have running on somebody else's computer? So the uh, initial back orifice, all it was, was it simply responded to the, uh, the back orifice ping packets. And this was useful for relocating a machine that you had previously discovered you had access to. Uh, because again, this was back in the dial-up days where people's IP address would change every time they reconnected over the phone to their ISP. But once I had software of my design running on somebody else's computer, I simply went through everything I could think of and implemented it. A lot of it was actually me learning about how to do Windows programming. And I simply kept thinking of more things to add, you know, obviously file and registry access, screen grabs, uh, keyboard logging, you know, these were all just kind of the logical you know, extension of if I have my software running on somebody else's computer without them knowing, what would I want to be able to do with it? At DEF CON 5, uh, we invited the media, sent out press releases that we were going to be releasing back orifice and basically gave Microsoft a chance to respond, even though there was really nothing they could fix to, to solve this. It wasn't an exploit. The Cult of the Dead Cal traditionally does presentations at DEF CON, but this was the first product release. None of it was really scripted. I had in my head uh, what I wanted to do to present the software. We had two laptops with two projectors, uh, one with the back orifice client, and then the other that I installed back orifice on. That was largely to show that pretty much nothing is visible on the target computer when uh, back orifice is running in the background, um, except of course for the dialog box, which there's no legitimate purpose you know, hacking wise to, to pop up other than to uh, disturb the um, user. There may have been plants in the audience. Uh, it, I, I don't really recall uh, a whole lot of that. I do remember somebody in the Q&A uh, asking about uh, open source and the encryption mechanism that it used. And they were shouted down by other people on the stage saying, you don't have to use this if, you, if, you, if you're concerned about that kind of thing. The person who caught the first CD that was thrown out uh, was not a plant. He legitimately took the CD and immediately put it into his computer and uh, then raised his hand and said he couldn't find it. And I pointed out that, you know, it, he had inserted an auto run CD on his computer and it was probably there now. He just needed to look for it. I don't think there was any actual legitimate hecklers during the presentation. It was very well received. And when I did things like open up a remote shell on a Windows 95 computer, which nobody had ever seen before, people seemed very uh, excited. Back Orifice was very effective at giving people remote control of other people's computers. Unfortunately, the response from many organizations was not to address the security issues, but instead to recommend to people that they move from Windows 95 and Windows 98 to Microsoft's latest version of software, Windows NT. But the Cult of the Dead Cow had another trick up their sleeve, Back Orifice 2K. Sardistic is about to tell us why the back orifice used UDP ports instead of TCP and why it communicated over the elite port. He's also going to tell us this really cool trick that he used to get back orifice to hide itself from the task manager so you couldn't see it when you were infected. You'll want to hear those answers and many more in the full uncut interview, which is available right now on this channel. And you'll want to come back next time for part two of this conversation when we talk to Dildog about Back Orifice 2K and the release of that product. Thanks to the sponsor of this episode, SANS SEC 673 Advanced Python for Information Security Professionals. If you already have Python skills and you're ready to take those to the next level, come check out this advanced class.